Good morning, everyone. That was a nice song to walk up on, grateful. Thank you. You know, it's like, let's just make that our theme song, right? Maybe not this day, but every day. Of how many good things we are grateful for. And one of the things that I'm grateful for is to share this service with you, both those sitting here in the sanctuary and those online who are meeting with us later and at their convenience. One of the things um, that you may not know is that our online services have a small uptake on Sunday. A lot of the people who want to experience the service on Sunday are sitting here in the pews. But as the week goes on, the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger as those who, for whom Sunday morning is not convenient listen to the service at a time that is convenient for them. So the numbers continue to increase during the week, which means we are meeting a need for a wider congregation than just this one here. So I want, as we go through this, um, at this service and maybe through every service, just keep in mind that invisible cloud of witnesses that you can't see, but is sharing this experience with, with us here today. And so I'm glad, however you've come um, to St. Luke's, um, that you are with us and, and be welcome. I just want to make a couple of quick announcements before we start. Um, the first is that next week, um, we have. it seems that our food events in the church come in lockstep here. So next week on uh, Saturday is going to be Square Roots Pickup, and if you wish to order a vegetable order, please let the office know so that they can make sure to pick up is next Saturday. And the other one is our St. Luke's Market with fresh food and delightful um, bread and desserts and all kinds of good stuff. Well, you guys know how good this stuff is because you've had it before. Anyway, our next uh, St. Uh, Luke's Market will be next Sunday for pickup. So if you wish to have your food picked up next week, please notify the office during the week to make sure that, that, that you will not be disappointed. And the other announcement I wanted to make is that we have scheduled our annual congregational meeting for the 14th of February. Um, as with all of our meetings, it will be integrated within our service, so part of the service work. We are still working out some of the technical details about how that will be presented, and I should also note that if it turns out for any reason we are locked down by the government, then that meeting will move to Zoom. Um, we'll keep you updated on the plans. Uh, um, there is actually a town hall meeting in Region 15 on the 28th to discuss how this goes. And so if they give us any further clues about how to do it, we'll let you know. But I want to make sure you mark the date, 14th of February. Any, uh, anything I've forgotten that really needs to be said? Then let's just prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Imagine yourself on a lake shore, maybe not quite as snowy as today. You can hear the breezes and see the fishermen working, bringing back their haul after fishing all night. Those familiar sounds and smells of the seaside are something we have in common with that land of Galilee of old, an economy which depends greatly on fishing. And in the midst of all these fisher folk, Jesus calls out and says, I have another fishing chore for you. I light this candle in the name of the one who constantly calls us on. And I ring the, ring the bells calling us to worship uniting our hearts and our spirits as one. So now come to worship, where the waters are calm and the fishing is good, where we learn to work together for the sake of the gospel in faith that we will experience the Spirit of God in the wind and the waves. Will you join with me in the prayer that is up on the screen behind me? Our Jesus, you taught your disciples to cast a wide net, not for fish, but for people. Teach us the fishing craft. Make our fingers nimble so that we may handle hearts and hands gently. Make our minds quiet and patient 
so we may share with humility and make our hearts hungry for your word so we have something to share for the sake of the one who has captured our hearts already, Jesus Christ. Amen. So some of the members of the choir are going to come up and help us sing today. Number 567, Will You Come and Follow Me? Scripture this morning is taken from Palm, uh, Psalm 90, verses 14 to 17, and Luke 5, verses 1 to 11. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. And from Luke, Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. 
He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. May the word of God bring love and joy to our hearts. Amen. So I picked out the music for this service long before I came up with the title for the sermon. In fact, it was even more than that. I wanted to have this music and I went looking for the text to figure out which Sunday to put it on. That's not how it usually goes. Usually I, I sit down with, the, with, with the, the scriptures and go, now what do I pick for him? But this one I had decided because the story of Jesus going out in the boats and calling the fishermen to fish for people is such a powerful story inside my head. It's one, I don't know about you folks, I remember it from Sunday school. It's one of those um, image-based stories that it's easy for a child to, 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 to think of the story in their head, and so it's often taught to Sunday school children. And uh, therefore, also, I think, easy for hymn, hymn writers to write some really good music around it. And we've got a couple of my favorites coming up towards the end of the service. So it's a Sunday school text, it's a hymn writer text, it's a text beloved by um, all Christians, the calling of disciples, and that, that um, sort of phrase that sticks, sticks in, our, uh, in, our, in our memories from childhood. I, I, I know that inclusive language is a big part of my ministry, but I probably, like you, I'm going to teach you to fish for men. Isn't that how we learned it? But, uh, but the... Um, the, the new translation, the Rise Standard, says it for people because it's not just male people we're looking for, but really everybody. And that was one of the hallmarks of Jesus' ministry. So, well-known, well-known phrase sticks in our head. And I got to tell you, since I've become a professional follower of Jesus and read deeper into the Bible, one of the things I have learned is to be a little suspicious of the story when I think I know it already really well. Because very often, the Sunday school lessons that we learned as children about what passages are all about are not always true, and not always a deep understanding of what Jesus was really trying to say. In fact, I think these familiar texts are the hardest ones for Christians to read and see what was really there, because they are so comforting to us. But it's been my discovery as I read the Bible is that Jesus really had no particular interest in making people feel comfortable. Quite the opposite. He really was interested in making people feel uncomfortable in a way that would make them challenge their their existing ideas. And so if a text seems to support the status quo, 
Oh, isn't it wonderful? We're all called as disciples. This is so lovely, but it's okay. We don't need to do any more work because we're already the children of Jesus, right? If that's the sort of feeling that we have when we read it, the warm, fuzzy feeling, that should be a sign that you should be digging a little deeper into the text and what does it mean. So I want to just take a few minutes and take a deeper dive into the calling of the first disciples. I'm not sure there's big surprises here, like big things that will change completely your, your viewpoint, but I think the deeper meaning is maybe something that it's worth looking at. But before I talk about that deeper meaning, I just want to take a quick detour into my favorite topic when it comes to Bible, which is, which is how the Bible was written and put together. Just take a few minutes about that. And we're starting with the idea of what is a gospel. How did the four gospels come to be? The idea of gospel and the word comes from the Greek word which means good news. So the gospels are stories of good news. And this kind of, of writing was invented by the, whoever it was who wrote the gospel of Mark. Mark would have been reading in the culture around him, in Greek culture, romance novels of the time about the sons of God. And I don't know if you folks ever studied the stories of Hercules, maybe, when you were kids. The Greek myths, the Troy, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some of those ancient um, adventure stories. They were literally adventure stories, the kind of thing that young children would thrill to hear. And so those stories were around, and Mark knew that Jesus was also a son of the gods, like Hercules was a son of the gods. So he said, let's write a romance novel about the adventures of Jesus. How many of you ever thought about Mark as the adventure stories of Jesus? Not how my Sunday school teachers taught it. I think they didn't want us to be going on any adventures, especially not in their class. So Mark wrote the story of Jesus as if it was an adventure story from his culture. He was the first person to think of that. Now we can't think of any other way because when Mark wrote down his adventure story, the only writings there were about Jesus were basically lists of things that Jesus had said. So they, they, people wrote down, you know, it's kind of like note-taking on a scrap of paper. People would write down a little thing that Jesus had said and somebody else would write it down and then somebody would make a list with all these collections. And so into that environment came Mark's adventure story. And then it went out to the world. And two other writers, one named Matthew and one named Luke, Matthew was a Jewish leader in the church, and Luke was a Gentile or non-Jewish leader in the church, got this story and said, these are fabulous, but there's a whole bunch of stories that Mark left out. And so they wrote their Gospels using Mark's basic story as a framework, but adding in other stories that they had from other writings that they had. And we're pretty sure it's writings because there's parts of Mark and Matthew that aren't in Mark, but are word for word in the two other Gospels. And so our story from Luke that we are reading today about the fishermen being called to be disciples is a story that Mark originally wrote, but Luke has added to from other stories that he knows. That covers Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but the other gospel is John. And if you've ever read all the gospels, the one thing you will know is John is the dissenter. His gospel is not like anything. Um, that is in the other book. The stories are all in different orders. They don't happen in the same time frame. Things that happen at the beginning in, in, in Mark happen at the end in John and so on like this. Um, we think that probably the reason why is because John and Mark and, and the other two gospel writers lived very far from each other. And they didn't have TV or the internet for instant communication. So this, the pool of stories they had were rather different. And this has caused people who study this to say, if a story is both in Luke and in John, or both in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and in John, probably that's a very old tradition within the scriptures. Probably goes all the way back to Jesus, it's, or there's a good argument can be made. The calling of the disciples at the seashore is not in John. He has a calling of the disciples story, which also involves the calling of Peter, 
but really they're just in a house. Nothing, no seashore. However, the seashore does appear in the Gospel of John in chapter 21. Peter, um, the, Jesus has died and been resurrected. Peter decides he's going to go back to fishing. He goes fishing, and he catches nothing all night. You know, he's feeling like not a very good disciple, and now he's not even a very good fisherman. And then a stranger on the shore says, go cast your nets on the other side, you're going to catch some fish. And then he hauls up the, the nets, and the nets are so full, they're just about ready to break, just like in the story that, you, that Jane read from Luke today. So that part of the story is in both Luke and in John, not in either of the other two Gospels. And, and uh, so I think that's another important kind of story that was, that was held by the community. I think the idea of the fish, so many fish in the net that the net might break, indicates that the Christian God is so full of abundance, there's always more than enough in Jesus' kingdom. Why is it, though, that John thought that story belonged at the end of the, the, the Gospels, whereas Luke thought it happened at the beginning? The truth is, we don't know when it happened, although the fact that it involved a miracle probably means it belongs to a collection of stories after Jesus was resurrected, when he was no longer an ordinary human but could do miracles. But I think the point that it is in these two different Gospels at two different places indicates that it's not so much a part of either story, but what's happening next? In, like, where is it in the life of the disciples? And I think the, where it is in the life of the disciples is in both cases, the disciples are about to have a job change. They are about to be going out and telling people the good news. They are about to become evangelists. In one case, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, while he's still there, and in the other case, at the end of Jesus' ministry, when he's gone. All right, back to our time today. Those first century fishermen were called by Jesus to leave everything they knew. And that was not a small calling. It says they left everything and followed him. And all I could think of was Peter's wife, living a very marginal life, dependent on the fish that Peter caught to feed his kids. And then Peter says, bye, honey, I'm leaving. How would that go over in your house, by the way? Yeah, not so well in, in mine either. The gospel is such an important thing for Peter, and he has found something so amazing that he is ready to leave all of his responsibilities, leave everything behind to tell this story of good news, to become an evangelist. And that's true whether it's at the beginning of Jesus' story or at the end. And I think what's hard to hear for us in the 21st century, that Jesus' call to each of us is still to leave everything we've known, to get outside our comfort zone, to be called on to a new adventure. I think very often in the 21st century, we assume we're already followers of Jesus, so we got it all together, right? I actually suspect that Peter was already a follower of Jesus before this story even started, but he was still doing the same old things he'd been doing before, still continuing to fish, still tied down in one location and, being, uh, and not able to branch out and tell the good news to all those other people who weren't at the Sea of Galilee and did, otherwise would not have a chance to listen. Are we like that? Are we tied down in just one place? I think in a sense we are. And in our 21st century context, that idea of being tied down in one place is not a fishing boat and a series of responsibilities, but a church building. We, as Christians, love our buildings. We worked hard to build them. We take pride in them, justifiably. Um, and as a friend of mine who, who talks about Christianity with me very regularly says, church buildings are assets. It means that you can have meetings and do things there in a way that you can't if you don't have a building. 
The problem with that is the buildings become our comfort zones. We can control what happens inside our building in a way we can't control what happens outside. And we love our churches, and we are, if we are generous, and this St. Luke's community is incredibly generous, I have to say that completely, then we want to share our buildings with the community. We want to invite them in. We want to rent to them. We want to invite them to our programs. Um, we are justifiably, I think, um, proud of our ability to be community centers. But Jesus does not say to the fishermen, Next, we will set up your boats as a teaching center so the whole world may come to you. Jesus says, we're going out into the world. Leave your boats and follow me. We're on the move. I have discovered in my ministry that whenever I suggest, let's take a church program outside the walls of the church so we might meet a different crowd, I'm often met with puzzlement. Why would you want to do that? we got a perfectly good building here. It's going to be trouble to get outside our walls. The truth is, for the last, say, 17 or 1800 years, we've settled down in our buildings and waited for the world to come to us. Our buildings have been architectural wonders and tourist attractions. We have been community centers and emergency shelters. Our buildings have done a lot of big work. But one of the realities of the 21st century context is most of the community no longer comes to the church buildings. They just don't. I know so many of my friends feel uncomfortable walking into a church. They are uncomfortable because they are afraid they are going to be judged. To the point where, and I bet you you've heard this before, that someone will come to church for some kind of function that they hadn't been there before, and the whole time they're there, they're cracking jokes about, I hope you've got your lightning insurance paid up because I'm in the church and sure as shooting, the lightning's going to hit today. In fact, uh, I actually once served a church that lightning had hit once or twice, and uh, they, they kind of told me confidentially that um, when the lightning hit, the, and it was during a service, everybody looked around to see who wasn't usually there, but was there that day. That was enterprise. <laughs> yeah. People feel a little scared walking into our building. They feel like they don't measure up. They, they, they're what, what Peter is when Jesus says, I want you to be fishing for people. And Peter falls down on his face and he says, don't pick me, I am a sinful man. I'm not good enough for this gospel. And that's a significant liability here in the 21st century. Because there is so much world outside our building. If we just stay here and we just preach inside these walls, then we run the risk of never getting the message to the people who desperately need to hear it because they will not come to us. I think just like in the first century church, Jesus is calling the 21st century church to leave our comfort zones behind and to leave our buildings to go where the people are former moderator of the United Church, said that one of the ways that he um, determines how is God acting is to look around and see what's happening. So he said, this would be uh, David Giuliani, by the way, he said um, that he looks inside the church and he says the churches are emptying. So he, what? He asked if God was the one emptying the churches. Why would God empty the church? And his answer was, because out there is where the action is. God's action is out in the world. And if we, the church people, want to be part of God's action, that means we need, sometimes at least, to get beyond our own walls. And I preach this today particularly. Not because I'm trying to say we should abandon this magnificent building. It continues to be a great resource. It just needs to not define our whole action. We need to be a little bigger in the world than that. But the reason why I particularly am preaching this today is because we are hopefully, pray God, in the last stages of the COVID emergency, 
the vaccines are being distributed. Although I, I resist the notion that our lives will shortly go back to normal, I do think that there will be a new normal that will be more open than we currently are in our semi-locked down state. And during the time of COVID, we've been told to stay the blazes home, right? Um, a Nova Scotia phrase, you know what he was really saying when he said blazes, don't you? I'm not allowed to say it in church, but anyway. Um, but anyway, the thing is, is that we've been told to stay home. Our safety is staying inside our buildings. And I'm a little concerned that that can become too comfortable. I know you feel like you're shack wacky. But one of the things that I know during this whole COVID lockdown is, frankly, during hard lockdown, I felt better than I sometimes do these days because I never had to question what to do. It's simple. I go get groceries and then I come home. Right? That's easy. Um, my daughter said that too. She works in retail and, the, and also works in the restaurant. And she said it was harder when things were partially open than it was when things were locked down tight. And I worry that after a number of months of being locked down tight, we're going to get in the habit of not reaching out to the wider community again. I think we actually need to work hard against that. I think we need to be asking the hard questions about who is not here amongst our seats. We need to be asking who are we not serving and how can we get out to see them. Um, those kinds of questions need to be asked or we will run the risk of cocooning in our little safe building and not doing the work that Jesus calls us to, to get outside into the wider world. So as Jesus says, it's time to hit the road. Whatever means it takes. Online, in person, out in the superstore telling people how great our story is. Hit the road. Amen. Now this song, this next song we're going to sing, we're pretty sure the choir members tell, it, tell me that they know they've sung it before because they got word changes scribbled in the book. But it may be new to you. It's a little bit rhythmic. Um, I think probably what I'm going to ask you folks to do as you hum along with it is maybe get up on your feet. We might actually um, clap a little bit. You never know. Um, the song is, comes from More Voices, number 113. It's called Jesus Saw Them Fishing. Won't you stand and join us? As you are able.
So. So thank you to all of you who have supported the many works we have done, both inside and outside this building over the years. And uh, thank you for your continued support. We could not do it without you. I invite the offering to come forward now. Pray with me. May these gifts cast a wide net in this world that you love and increase our fishing skills so that we might cast your words of life on troubled waters and the storms of life until all your children find a safe harbor. In Jesus' name, amen. that moment when a sneeze won't quite come and you're on a microphone. I'm hoping it holds off, otherwise somebody's going to get a bit of a shock. As we come to our prayer time, let's just take a little bit of time to relax and let go. I'm going to give you a little bit of a visualization and then give you a time to pray, to pray the prayer of your hearts. So I invite you to sit in your chair, um, put your feet on the floor, sit up straight. You might want to put your hands in your lap. The idea is to get your body sitting straight and supported. Just breathe naturally. The good air going in and out of your lungs. Don't think about the breathing, just let it be. Relax into the support of your chair. Trust that for these few moments, you don't have to hold yourself up, but indeed can relax into the support that you may not even have realized was there until you gave it a moment to think about. Now I want you in your mind's eye to fall back into an earlier time into a different country. Imagine yourself on the shores of a lake which you have heard of many times, the Sea of Galilee, in the northern part of Israel, in Galilee of old, the countryside where Jesus grew up. Hear the waves lapping on the shore. Hear the voices of the fishermen working on their nets, washing them from the night's work and repairing any little tears that might have happened. Ordinary, friendly talk. Hear the wind blowing lightly around your ears. Feel the heat of the morning sun. Now, as you sit there, a man comes to the shore. He is ready to speak and to listen. He says very little, but turns to you in the sunny shore with the breeze riffling your hair and says, tell me what is on your heart today. I want you to imagine now what you would say to that man, the one who calls you to follow him. Open up the concerns of your heart in this silence.
And as he continues to listen, I invite you to say to him a prayer you have today for the world in your silent prayers. And as he continues to listen, I invite you to say to him a silent prayer that you have for someone you are concerned about. And as he continues to listen, I invite you to say now a prayer for yourself. Having been heard by the man on the shores of the sea, I invite you now to take strength from that hearing, to feel yourself nourished by the listening and the, the water lapping and the sun and the air, knowing that God wants you to have abundance and wants all of God's children to have abundance. And the good news is that there is enough for all of us if only we know how to share. Be strengthened by this word. Be fed so that you may be properly nourished in your body and spirit to continue the work of this week. And now I invite you to step away from that lakeshore, carrying it with you, but feel yourself coming back to this place on a January winter day that looks so different from that lakeshore but is just as beautiful. And as we prepare ourselves to walk out into the snow and the sun and light of our time, let us say together the prayer that that man at the side of Galilee taught his people, saying, Our mother and father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Now as you're ready, open your eyes and come back to this place where we're getting ready to sing one more hymn. But before we sing it, I call you now, having heard these words and Jesus' call to get past our own comfort zone, that you may go out into the world ready to spread the good news in whatever way you can, ready to tell people the story of the one who has given you abundance and the story that there is enough if only we all share. And as you go, may the living Christ go with you. May he go behind you to support you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to empower you, and ahead of you to show you the way. Amen. And I want to close with this lovely hymn from, um, this is from our uh, Spanish partners. Um, I think actually this one might come from, uh, from Argentina, Argentina, but I'm not sure. Anyway, from our Spanish language friends who always make gorgeous melodies, we're going to sing this one, Jesus, You Have Come to the Lakeshore, number 563.
Thank you.